God bless the old Tyler. How long has he trudged through sunshine and storm with his summonses due? No pain nor fatigue the old Tyler has grudged to serve the great order, Freemasonry and you. God bless the old Tyler. How oft was he led the funeral procession from lodge door to grave? How grandly his weapon has guarded the dead to their last quiet home where acacia boughs wave. God bless the old Tyler. How oft has he knocked when vigilant strangers craved welcome and rest? How widely your portals, though guarded and locked, have swung to the signal the Tyler knows best. There's a lodge where the door is not guarded nor tiled. There's a land without graves, without mourners or sin. There's a master most gracious, paternal and mild. And he waits the old Tyler and bids him come in. And there the old Tyler, no longer outside, no longer with weapon of war in his hand, a glorified spirit shall grandly abide, and close by the master, high honoured, shall stand. Welcome to From the Quarries. If you're new here, welcome along. I hope you found what you're looking for. To our return viewers and subscribers, welcome back. It's great to see you. This has been a very exciting week for the channel. For the second time, we've been honoured with a feature page in the Queensland Freemasons magazine, which was published earlier in the week. So thanks so much to Brother Lovewell for your ongoing support of the channel. This week's video is a lovely presentation about an oft neglected position within the lodge, or without the lodge, as the case may be. The Tyler was written by Ori Spiegelman, and it was first published in the California Freemason in the spring of 1993. I really hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Historically, we know that the medieval operative craft guilds jealously guarded their trade secrets. They would post a sentry outside the meeting place to protect it from inspection or intrusion by the uninitiated. He was known as an outer guard, guarder or doorkeeper, and often was the most junior apprentice who was not eligible to attend the trade discussions. From a Masonic perspective, the Tyler continued this guarding tradition. In the 1723 First Book of Constitutions, Dr. James Anderson mentioned another brother to look after the door, but shall not be a member of it, and in Regulation 26, charged the use of porters or doorkeepers. The English Grand Lodge, in 1728, ascribed him more importance as an officer who kept the door, and, in its minutes of June the 8th, 1732, initially referred to his specific title as the Tyler. In 1738, he was described as brother the doorkeeper to lock up all aprons. The word Tyler first appeared in print in New Regulation 26 of the 1738 Second Book of Constitutions. Here, Anderson recalled Old Regulation 13 of the First Grand Lodge of 1717, which required that another brother and master mason should be appointed the Tyler to look after the door. And so, our ritual today tells us that he is a brother without the door. The early Tylers wore very colourful clothing, the Grand Lodge Tyler of 1736, for example, was described as wearing 
a red waistcoat under a dark blue coat trimmed with gold lace, yellow trousers, and a large triangular hat. He even wore his, this uniform in public, as when delivering summonses or in processions, and was often subject to ridicule. The ritual tells us that he is armed with the proper implement of his office, not only to ward off potential intruders, but also symbolically guard the Book of Constitutions from alteration. This was described as a sharp instrument, initially a pointed trowel and later a sword. It gave him such great authority that even our military brethren of yesteryear were required to relinquish their swords before entering the lodge room. Today, our Tyler uses only an emblem of his position, a single, unsheathed sword. However, in other jurisdictions, it may be crossed swords, right over left. Before opening some English lodges, a sword lies on the master's pedestal. At the proper moment, the tiler is summoned into the lodge and must answer certain questions as to his place and duties. Then the master hands him the sword, investing him with the power to ward off intruders and suffer none to pass but such as were duly qualified. It is interesting that English, Irish and Scottish lodges have an inner guard posted within the lodge room door under the direction of the junior warden. He shares responsibilities with the tiler, monitoring members' entry and exit, announcing visitors and advising entrants as to which degree the lodge is working on. Who is this tiler and what are his duties? He is appointed to his office and compensated for his duties and lonely position. He is a master mason, usually a past master, who is respected and well informed in Masonic law and custom. His qualities must include a good memory, trustworthiness, dignity, geniality, understanding, sympathy, patience, and dedication. He need not be a member of the Lodge, but, if so, he has the right to debate and vote. He recognises and greets the brethren, assuring that they are duly qualified by being clean, not inebriated, and properly clothed with aprons. He is a one-man welcoming committee for visitors, giving them the first and most important impression of his lodge. He assures that members and visitors sign the Tyler's Register. In the old days, when taverns and other non-permanent places were used, it was the Tyler's charge to form or draw the lodge with chalk and charcoal. Within a rectangle, he displayed various Masonic emblems of the proper degree level. His classical duties included the preparation and service of notices and summonses. He had the key to the apron box and was in charge of the lodge's possessions, arranging them properly for upcoming meetings and securing them afterwards. He gave notice of the times of calling on and calling off, oversaw the proper preparation of candidates and even collected visitors' dinner fees. The special Tyler's knock signals the lodge already in session that a qualified brother requests admission. He will refuse entry to anyone whom he does not personally recognise or who cannot be properly vouched for by another brother. If this visitor is subsequently cleared by an ad hoc examining committee, he will administer the Tyler's oath. This will ascertain that the brother was regularly initiated, passed and raised in a just and legally constituted lodge, that he stands not suspended or expelled from his own lodge, and that there is no other reason why he cannot hold Masonic communication with the brethren of the lodge. The Tyler is specifically warned to observe the approach of cowans and eavesdroppers, and not to allow their entry into the lodge. What is a cowan? Theories abound in the Masonic literature about the word's derivations from one of several languages, with diverse meanings, 
such as dog, wretch, or silly fellow. It was probably a 16th century Scottish operative term of contempt, given to the ignorant or partially instructed labourer who hadn't completed the proper period of apprenticeship, and who was perhaps skilled only in one facet of masonry. He was also known as a rough mason, or dry diker, who built structures with unhewn stones and without mortar, the stones keeping in position only by their own weight. His exclusion from guild membership was was a necessary means of trade protection from competition by unskilled labourers. Some Cowans, though, were master masons, who had been expelled or moved to another area without joining the local lodge. The old lodge of Kilwinning warned that, under penalty, a master mason should not employ a cowan unless a regular craftsman was not found within 15 miles of the building site. In later times, though, they were employed by the guilds for their specific skills, at lower compensation rates. Speculatively, the term cowan refers to one who is not yet a master mason, a master mason dropped for cause, or one who has unlawful Masonic knowledge, having been initiated or having communication with the regular or clandestine lodge. The eavesdropper, however, is a more suspicious character. Eaves describes the space between a building's wall and the line where the rain drops off the roof. Here, the surreptitious listener could position himself, monitoring conversations in the lodge from which he might learn some of its secrets, or gather materials to create slanderous tales. The modern eavesdropper receives his information from various sources and then masquerades as a mason in order to obtain charity or other means of help. The spellings Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, and Tyler, T-I-L-E-R, are interchangeable, with the former an older usage. The Masonic application of the word, subject to much uncertainty and speculation as to its symbolism, may somehow derive from the interdependent working relationship of the operative Masons and Tylers. Indeed, their regulations and ordinances, called points, P-O-Y-N-T-Z, were quite similar. These survive today in such expressions as arts, parts and points, points of entrance, and five points of fellowship. The most prominent etymologic theory is that tile was derived from the Latin tegula, meaning to cover. With the Roman occupation of Britain, bricks and tiles were introduced as permanent building materials. But after the Romans' withdrawal, the style reverted to wooden buildings covered with reeds and straw. Unfortunately, these combustible buildings were set quite close together. After a series of devastating fires in London, an ordinance was passed in 1212 requiring that roofs be covered with tiles, lead, shingles or plastered straw. The operative tiler guilds were formed at about that time and existed until the mid-1800s. So, it was thought, that as the operative tiler covered the roof of a building with tiles to conceal its interior and protect it from the elements, so the Masonic tiler figuratively covers or protects the secrets of the lodge by guarding it from inspection or intrusion by the uninitiated. The strange Masonic word heel, H-E-L-E, had a relation to the word tile, in that the Latin helan also meant to cover or conceal. Tradesmen known as heliers, equivalent to roofers, thatched with reeds, healed with tiles, or daubed with plaster to cover a building. To heal, H-E-A-L, a wound, with modern spelling, is to cover it. Heal, 
does not mean a cost or salute. Another theory comes from a book entitled Process de Templier, which discussed the early French knighthood. While chapter meetings were being held, a sentry known as the Toulier was posted on the roof on the tiles. From this lofty position, he could easily observe the approach of any unauthorised person. It is thought that the English adopted this French custom for the craft lodges. Although their functions are similar, it seems somewhat far-fetched that our garter of the door was derived from the sentry on the roof. I would like to propose a new theory about the tiler's origin, having nothing to do with tiles or its craft. Consider that the word tiler was derived or misspelled from the word tiller. Even if spelled with a Y, T-Y-L-L-E-R, the phonetics of the Y need not be E-Y-E, but rather I-H, I, like the first Y in the word sympathy or timpani. The tiller of a boat is defined as a lever that steers the rudder, and a tiller of the earth describes one who properly cultivates it. From the first meaning, we can make the speculative analogy that as the boat's tiller properly sets its course to a proposed destination, guiding it to avoid obstacles, and thereby guiding it from harm, so our tiler cares for each worthy brother and candidate. In his anteroom, he registers, clothes, and then directs him on a proper course into the lodge room. From the second meaning, we learn about proper preparation by the dispersion of impeding growth conditions. We may speculate that as the tiller ploughs and hoes, uprooting the weeds and loosening or removing the stones, and then fertilises and sows the earth, so our tiler protects the lodge from the intrusion of improper influences and correctly prepares each brother and candidate. Then, the analogy continues, as the earth has thus become receptive to plant growth, so may the brother or candidate be considered qualified to undergo a symbolic passage or transition from the mundane physical world to an environment conducive to spiritual growth within the lodge. Our tiler, therefore, can be thought of as a tiller of men. Although I have no historical evidence to substantiate this etymological insight, I believe the theory well describes the positions and duties of our Tyler. Since we learn the value of proper preparation and the virtue of caution from him, then each of us should, in a way, be our own Tyler. Let us tile ourselves when recommending and investigating candidates. Let us tile our discussions about the ritual. Let us tile the business discussed in Lodge, and especially that which relates to our members and candidates. Let us tile our words and actions to foster harmony, as this will not only preserve our own integrities and reputations, but also that of our beloved fraternity. That was the tiler. And what a wonderfully researched presentation it was too. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in more Masonic content, consider subscribing to From the Quarries or visit our webpage at www.fromthequarries.com. We publish regular updates on the website as well as YouTube videos once a week, shorts almost every day, And there's also quite a dynamic little conversation group going on on the channel homepage on YouTube with quizzes and conundrums published several times a week. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I look forward to seeing you next time.